chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 is where we'll give our attention for a few minutes tonight. I appreciate uh, all the guys that lead singing. I, I look forward to this. We do this every second Sunday night uh, of the month, and I, I like it for a couple of reasons. I like that we get to spend a little bit more time focusing our minds to some degree on singing and uh, singing more songs and praising God in that way, but I also like to see different uh, age ranges of our congregation exercising the abilities that God has given them. We've got young guys, and we have older guys that lead, not old, but older guys that lead songs too, and uh, all kinds of folks in between, and I appreciate that and their willingness to do that because it's not easy uh, to lead singing, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great, great thing. I'm glad and thankful that, that men uh, like them do that. Um, Acts 8 uh, falls in a section of Scripture uh, that I personally find convicting maybe more than some of the other passages in the New Testament. I'm drawn to chapter 7 in this particular context because of Stephen. I like Stephen. I like Stephen's story. I like what Stephen stood for. I like his courage in the face of people that obviously had the power to hurt Stephen physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But nonetheless, Stephen stood the test of time, even the test of faith, and was killed, martyred for his faith, the first Christian martyr. But what you learn in this section of Scripture, starting in chapter 6, was that it wasn't just Stephen that was enduring hostility for his faith, that it was the church the world over, that the, the whole first century church was being persecuted. It just was expedited by Stephen's death. Stephen actually busted the doors wide open for persecution in the church, and that's where you pick up in chapter 8. As a result of Stephen dying for his faith, then the church began to be more widely persecuted under the direction of Saul of Tarsus. And it even says in Acts 7 that when Stephen was being persecuted, Saul was there. He saw it all happen. It it's like he signed off on it, and then in chapter 8, when you turn the page, he's the one that's leading the charge to kill all these Christians. Now, before we dive any further into Acts 8 for just a few minutes, I want to point out something to you. And I know that as you've been a student of God's Word for any length of time, there are probably these techniques or these things that people have taught you and shared with you to help you study the Scripture more. And one of the things that most scholars will do or say when they're writing books about guides to help you study the Bible better, or even people that have put the time in and just uh, write uh, along those lines to help you study the Bible together, one of the things they almost always do is make you look for keywords. There are certain words that they tell you to look for. If there's a, a conjunction or something like that, or if there's a big word, like a, a word that you don't recognize, it probably means something. If there's a big word, you know, just all these little techniques to find things. And one of the words that always comes up is the word therefore. You know you've heard that before. If you're reading in your Bible and you see the word therefore, then you should stop and see what it's there for. That's what I was taught all my life. There's a reason why the word is there. Now, you might be reading a different version than the King James tonight. I would venture to say that probably 90% of us are not reading the old King James, but there might be some of us here that are. And in the old King James, in Acts 8 and verse 4, it begins with the word therefore. But in your Bible, if you're reading the ESV, you might see the word so or now. Some more modern translations have one or the other, one or the other, either so or now. But I would present to you tonight, before we go any further in Acts 8, I want you to think about this word therefore. It's an adverb that, that is put in place to, to be a hinge, basically. It shows you that what's happened before produces a result. And the result is what follows after the word therefore, or so, or now. But it's this word that hinges two circumstances or situations together. The first or the former being the reason, and the latter being the result. That's interesting to me when you look at Acts 8 and verse 4. Now, the Bible says in Acts 8 and verse 4, So, or now, or therefore, those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. I find it really interesting because of what you read in the first three verses. Namely, in verse 1, it says that Saul was essentially wreaking havoc on the churches, that he was going into these places and he was driving people out because they named the name of Christ. That's what happened. Severely persecuting the church in verse number 1. In verse 3, 
he was ravaging the church. Some translations say he was causing havoc in the church. He would enter house after house, dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. Now, I'll read those two verses, Acts 8.1, Acts 8, 3, knowing what's happened in Acts 6 and 7, that Stephen was in this discussion or debate, if you will, with these religious higher-ups, and Stephen ultimately challenges them and their faith in Jesus. Stephen never said anything wrong. They, they accused him of hating Moses and hating the prophets. And what Stephen was trying to help them understand is that while Moses and the prophets were great, Jesus was greater, and he came to fulfill everything Moses and the prophets said. But they accused him of hating Moses and the prophets, and, and, and ultimately it led to Stephen's Death, Because he tells them, you, you're just stiff-necked people. You're not willing to listen to what I have to say. And as a result of Stephen standing up for Jesus, chaos ensues, namely what you see in verses 1 and 3. Now, I, I read that, and I'm like, I can't imagine. First of all, I can't imagine, like verse number 1, severe persecution. I don't know anything about that, neither do you. I mean, I guess in some way or another we can see it in our world. It's not so much here in America, but it is true that people, Christians, are persecuted because their faith severely. I've had discussions with Ray Atencio. He's not here tonight. Maybe you've heard some of his stories that he's told, and Ray would tell you next time you see him about some of the ways that they had to worship when he was in the military and, and them banging weapons on the window to make them quiet down when they're singing. I mean, people, people, that's with permission with soldiers outside, but there are people that don't have permission and have to worship in secret. It's like, I can't imagine it in America right now, but I try to. I try to imagine what it must have been like to be a Christian to endure such hostility, and that's not even the extent of it. Look at verse 3. They're, they're being ravaged. I mean, they're going house to house, Saul and these people are, and they're dragging men and women out of their houses. They're throwing them in prison, essentially making them laughing stocks in the middle of the city. They're, they're treating these people terribly on the sole basis that they have joined themselves with Jesus to the point that in verse number one, they're being scattered all throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. I, I, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it, trying to fathom how children of God are being dragged out of their homes, expelled from their hometowns, being killed, some of them, and even the others put in prison. Imagining that hostility, imagining suffering being uprooted from your childhood home, or uprooted from your family, or uprooted from your friends, or uprooted from your source of income, or uprooted from anything that was normal in daily life. And, and, and I read those verses and I think about this idea and, and I think that's where our word therefore becomes so interesting in Acts 8 and verse 4 or now or so depending on which translation you have. That's why it's so interesting to me. Because if you were to read those verses you would draw a natural conclusion based on the severe persecution, the being dragged out of their homes, the being thrown in prison, and essentially being killed, it would make sense that the Bible says, therefore, they were scattered everywhere. It would make sense that you read it that way. It would make sense that people were being taken away from their homeland if there's severe persecution and people that are, I guess, making them suffer in this certain way. It makes sense that it would say, they were scattered. They were persecuted, of course. They went everywhere. But it's interesting that the Bible says it was more than just a forced relocation. It wasn't that they were just scattered for the sake of the persecution. There was actually something that was purposeful about this. Look at verse number 4 again. So, those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. With that word, therefore or now, or so, depending on your translation, it tells me that their actions and their purpose that they're carrying out in verse number four, it was not hindered one bit by suffering. It wasn't hindered by, by one bit of persecution. That It actually propelled their purpose and propelled their plan to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they went everywhere preaching the word. I want you to think about this. Let's put the verses together. They were persecuted for their faith, expelled from their homelands, cast into prison, even killed, so they went everywhere preaching the word. 
Now, what I would like to challenge you with tonight as we bring our thoughts to a close, we conclude this night of worship and praise to God. I would like to challenge you. If there were a statement of results that were made about your faith and the way that you handle suffering, what would be your therefore? What would be your therefore? Ty was dragged from his home. He was thrown into prison. He was made a laughing stock in front of all the people. Or maybe I could say it this way. Ty, Ty was having a, a problem with his work. Or Ty was having a problem with someone in his everyday life. Ty, Ty was struggling with sin. Ty was struggling with this. Or Ty was struggling with that. I, I, I'm dealing with some sort of something that's causing me to struggle in my faith with God. That would be a reason for me to be upset or be mad or even fly off the handle in some cases. Ty went out and did what? Therefore, as a result of those struggles, whatever it is, therefore, Ty went out and did what? Would my therefore in my life, as a result of my suffering, would it lead me to more Jesus or less Jesus? Would it lead others to more Jesus or less Jesus? Ty was suffering, therefore, Ty went out and. I would challenge you to think about your own life and your own faith, whatever it is you're dealing with that, that might cause you to feel like your heart, your soul, your faith, it's just scattered. You're struggling with sin. You're struggling with temptation. You're struggling with a difficult person at work. You're struggling with a health issue. You're struggling with financial issues. Maybe it is the case that someone's being mean to you because you've named the name of Christ. What is your life? What are the results of that situation in your life. What, what's said about you? This is happening to you, therefore you went out and what? Showed the world more of Christ or showed the world less of Christ? Uh, Troubles sometimes are here, I guess. We sang that this morning, Jesus is coming soon. I'm not sure if that's exactly true. I guess he is coming soon, maybe sooner than later, I hope. But I know this, that there are troublesome times, and presumably even closer to home than we would like to think, that it is true. We're going to deal with things because we're Christians. It just happens the way our country's headed, the way our world's headed. Because we want to be like Jesus, things are going to be difficult for us. And God is looking for people whose lives, whose therefores are followed by, they went everywhere living the word. They went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere telling the word. They went everywhere sharing the word because that alone will save those people and it will save us. I guess my thoughts were just sort of whirling around in my mind when I read that and I connected the dots and put the two together that, that all of that difficulty and struggling and persecution would be enough cause for them to be scattered everywhere, but that wasn't it at all. It actually just propelled their purpose to tell other people about the gospel. It actually put them on a better path to do exactly what they wanted to do as a result. Here you have the situation. They're being persecuted and dragged out of their homes, but the result of that was them preaching the word. What will your struggles end up in? Will it end up in you showing more of Jesus this week or less of Jesus this week? Uh, maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. You never obeyed the gospel. You have an opportunity to obey Jesus. You have an opportunity to be washed in his blood, to have a new life and a, and a new future, a new hope in Jesus Christ. Or maybe it is that you've obeyed the gospel and maybe you've been dealing with something that's causing you to suffer. You've been struggling, dealing with that persecution. And as a result of that struggling or as a result of that temptation or persecution or whatever it might be, you've shown less of Jesus and you'd like to show more of him, you can do that tonight. Whatever your heart desires, you can respond to heaven's invitation while we stand and as we sing.